Hi, everybody. So today we are going to start uh, chapter four, The Road to the Revolution. And um, just a re quick reminder, we do not necessarily follow your book. So while this is chapter four in your book, it is going to be a much more thorough discussion than your book gives of um, the road to getting to the revolution, uh, Revolutionary War. So you can use your book as a resource from here on out, but my notes and our discussions in class and our homework are the true source of the information that I want you to look uh, towards your research, okay? All right, back going forward, let's talk about life on a colonial farm. So the colonies have been established. They are starting to flourish. We are still under the British crown. Just a little background. We find that we have two sort of ways of living. The first and more common is farm life. So up and down the 13 colonies, we have farms, and those farms are usually run by very large families. If you had a large family, it was considered an advantage. Many hands were needed to run these large-scale farms, and um, families needed to be self-sufficient. Another very common thing that did happen is uh, you would lose children to um, death or to the Native Americans. That was quite common back then. Um, so families, you know, sometimes would have two, three, four children that would pass away either in childbirth or in early age because just bad medicine or, you know, lack of doctor, lack of hospital or uh, Native American attacks, disease. So um, families would oftentimes be a little bit larger than, than children who live to adulthood. Uh, families would live in farmhouses. This is a good picture of a farmhouse. Uh, the, my only little like issue with this picture is that the furnace or the fireplace was usually more in the center of the home. Homes of this time were very drafty. They were made of wood, obviously, and sometimes they were made of wood logs, depending on where they were. Sometimes they were made of wood panels with like a mud or a cake between them, but they were very cold. People slept on planks and uh, the fireplace was your only source of heat. It was also the only source of uh, hot water and it was the only source of cooking your food. So it was running constantly. Even in the summer, there was a fire going in their fireplaces. So um, let's move on. All right, there were towns at this time. They were not super common, but they did exist. Boston is starting to become a flourishing city as is New York and Philadelphia. It was much easier for people to sustain themselves. And one I didn't mention was Alexandria, Virginia was becoming a huge uh, city in and of itself during this time too. Um, it was easier for people to sustain themselves in a city. They had more access to doctors. They had more access to the mail. They had more access to just general life and civilization in general. So less chance of Native American attacks, more chance of getting help if something bad happened. Um, families were also very important. Single men and women were actually expected to live with a family as a servant or a boarder until they were married. So oftentimes, you, if you, especially if you were a woman and you were a teacher, which was common back then, and you were unwed, that was kind of a job that unwed women would do, they would live with a family until they were married. Um, women had a very interesting role in society at this point. They were expected to marry. Um, the men usually were chosen by their parents. They would look at a man's property, religion, and family interest before romantic love. Romantic love was not considered an important reason for marriage. Um, all property and money that a woman had before marriage went to her husband in a dowry, which we see is very common from way, way, way before this in time. And they didn't really have a role in public life. They had a major role in private life, running the home, caring for their children, um, helping to farm, but they couldn't vote or hold office. So we don't see any women in early politics, but they did have a lot of domestic responsibilities. They were uh, responsible for cooking and cleaning and laundry. They also would sp spin yarn, which was very important. They made all of the clothing, gardening, 
milking their animals, churning butter, tending chickens, all of those things were very important for women to do. And they really helped uh, society flourish. Young people were also expected to work. Children would start at the age of seven. And before the age of seven, they would be free to play games, marbles, hopscotch, leapfrog, and jump rope were super popular. Their toys would all be handmade. Um, but Around the age of seven, they would start to have to work on the farm. They would do household work or farm chores. If they lived in a city or a town, they would become an apprentice, usually under their mother's guidance or their father's guidance. If they were a boy, they would start to learn their father's trade. If they were a girl, they would start to learn how to run a household. So very important for children to work pretty early on. All right, so we talked about social classes a little bit in the last chapter, but we're going to look a little bit more into our, their social classes. So we have different social classes in America than they did in Europe. So if you were in Europe, your social class was determined by birth. Those that were wealthy always stayed wealthy, and those that were born poor mostly stayed poor. It was very, very hard to climb the social ladder. However, in America, and that's one of the reasons that America is so great, is that everybody was starting fresh. We look at Jamestown, and those were gentry class people who had to learn how to farm and survive, or they were going to die. So this whole idea of, well, I'm wealthy, it didn't mean anything in Jamestown. It didn't mean anything in the early colonies. So you could come over with nothing and build yourself up. This is where that start of the American dream really comes in. You can be a poor German farmer who comes over with nothing and build yourself into a really thriving merchant. This was really only applied to white settlers, and there were still many class distinctions. However, it was more equitable than it ever would have been in Germany. I mean, in Germany, in Europe. Let's look over here at the colonial social classes. So again, we have the gentry, which is the wealthy landowners, merchants, and financers, bankers. Then you have middling, which are tradesmen and professionals. So lawyers and doctors. So interestingly, they are second tier. We would say maybe in today's world, they would be you know first tier, but in early colonial society, they would be second tier. Then you have farmers who were this is really pertaining to white farmers, owners of small family farms who were profitable in their produce, but could potentially have years where they weren't so profitable. So it was hit or miss whether or not they were earning money for the year. Then you had mainly in the North, free black men and women with a wide range of jobs, but not the same rights as white citizens, usually did not own property. Then you had slaves who worked in homes, they were under the eye of a master and they had to be available at all times of day. So their jobs were to care for the children. Their jobs were to um, be butlers or servants within the household. And then you had slaves who worked in the fields. They would work sun up to sundown six days a week, much more common in the South than in the North, though it did happen in early America pretty much all over. So let's talk about the gentry. They were the upper uh, class of colonial society. They were wealthy planters, merchants, ministers, all royal officials, lawyers, and goldsmiths. And they lived a life of luxury. They would not have ever had to farm or pretty much lift a finger. Um, they would have been very well educated and usually were in frequent communication with people back in England. So they didn't have the same view of America. They were there to settle America for Europe, but they were not necessarily looking to start this new society. The middle class was made of small planters, independent farmers, artisans, and the men could vote and hold office. They were mostly white, but some were from African descent. About 1% of African Americans were free during this period. And then you have the poor. They looked up to the middle class as something to aspire to. And again, in America, they could aspire to become middle class or even to become gentry class. 
that would not have been the case in Europe. All right, now let's get to indentured servants. So um, they signed a contract to work from four to 10 years in the colonies for anyone who would pay for their ocean passage to the Americas. This was people of all races, in the 1600s, most servants came from England. So in the early, early colonies, most were coming from England. By the 1700s, though, Germany and Ireland are experiencing a lot of hardship and famine. So the people that are coming over during this time are German immigrants and Irish immigrants. They had very few rights. If they made it to the end of their term, they were given 50 acres of land. So there was a lot of push to make it to the end of their term. And the hardships they endured drove many to really hate the wealthy because they were treated very, very badly. And they went from essentially being free to being, you know, completely under servitude to another person. And uh, that caused a lot of hardship. All right. that didn't come up. Here we go. We're going to do one more. So um, we also have free African Americans. Sorry, guys. I don't know what's going on here. What happened in my picture? Shrink it. Let me move it. Let me shrink it. Okay. Um, here we go. So in 1790, we had 600,000 freed people of African ancestry versus 757,000 enslaved people. Just to give you a good comparison of the numbers. That's by 1790. So remember the first slave ship we think com came over in 1619. So we're talking almost 200 years later and we are at a massive amount of enslaved people and not a lot of freed African uh, people at this time. If you were a freed slave or you were a freed African, you were allowed to own property, but most property owners were not allowed to vote or sit on juries. They do not get this right until after the Civil War, briefly during Reconstruction, but then once Jim Crow takes over, they lose the rights again. 